Today's reading has two parts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and Acts 13, verses 1 to 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 13, verses 1 to 8. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them there as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn to the proconsul from the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, that's what I like to see, enthusiasm. It's already on the... We're looking at mission this morning. Oh, what a subject. What I'm going to say this morning is so simple. So you can sit back and relax. No long words. You don't have to have a degree in theology to understand what I'm going to say. And it's too hot anyway. When you think of the word mission or missionary, I wonder what comes to mind. Perhaps it's an image like this. This is a picture of, um, well, MAF, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. <clears throat> and we've had representatives from MAF here um, in the not-too-distant past sharing their story about being called to serve the Lord uh, in this way. Or perhaps it's an image like this. Perhaps when you think of mission, you might think of someone like Mother Teresa. I don't know. I bet you wouldn't think of an image like this. This is the Dordogne in France. And you think, mission in the Dordogne in France? But let me tell you, I know of a couple, they've come home now, but they were called by God in retirement to go to rural France, to the rural areas of the Dordogne, to set up a, a, a retreat house for ministers who were exhausted. Not only did they do that, but they set up a church in their front room every Sunday. And they also organized a network of fellowship in the area, a vast area. Because if you're a Christian out in rural France, you're a bit isolated. And they had a wonderful ministry called by God to do it. Switzerland. I did not know this. This is something I've only just recently learnt, that Switzerland's a bit of a desert spiritually. Now, if you're Swiss, you can correct me afterwards. But I know of a young family who have been called by God to go and serve in Switzerland to set up a, or plant a church out there. Now, you might say, well, if God called me to the Dordogne or to Switzerland, I would go. I would have no hesitation. But let me tell you, the couple that went to France to obey God's call were self-funding. Yes, they had a very blessed 
and rewarding time, but it costs them dearly. And the couple or the family who are going to Switzerland, they have hardly anything. And they're being supported by their home church network to go and plant a church there. So what about us? Here, Hampton, CSK. What does mission mean to us? This is what we've just had read. I believe in the Holy Spirit who gives power from on high and who sends us on mission. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, challenge us this morning. Amen. I will be perfectly honest with you. I did find preparing for this morning very, very challenging indeed. When I look back on my younger years, I see something in me that's laid dormant for far too long. Because if you'd known me in my late teens and early 20s, you'd have seen such a passion in my life for Jesus, for the gospel, that I wanted everyone to know about it. I just couldn't keep quiet. Now, God did, he did, but you might not believe it now, but I did once have quite a, a reasonably powerful singing voice. And I was so full of Jesus that I've been known to be on the top deck of a double-decker bus and singing Amazing Grace at the top of my voice. And amazingly, the whole bus joined in as well. Those were the days, my friends. Those were the days. I can remember the bus driver going, oh, amazing grace. Anyway, I worked. My first job was with social services in Kent County Council. And our offices were upstairs of an old building. And underneath, the, the rooms were empty and they echoed beautifully. Now, what a nerve I had got. I got permission from my boss to go and practice in my lunch break. And I would take my guitar along, knowing full well that the whole of the top floor would hear every single word that I sang. And I planned all the songs meticulously. I would start off with original sin. I would tell them how Jesus died for them. I would then talk about how he was alive again, and then I would tell them that they could all have free, eternal life, all in song. Because I couldn't keep quiet. It's like when I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit let my voice loose. I could even remember singing. I used to be part of the Fleet Street Christian Fellowship, because by then I worked in Fleet Street, and that's when all the newspapers were there, and uh, we used to go in the lunch breaks in the summer, obviously, to share the gospel and sing in the pub gardens. What a nerve I had got. But I couldn't keep quiet, and I just happened to be able to sing very loudly so that nobody could miss it, and it was wonderful. Just as an aside, and I'm just going to part what I want to talk about for a moment. About 15 years ago, I began to lose my voice. And I had speech therapy, quite a few sessions, but it got weaker and weaker and weaker. And I can remember pleading with God, Plead, please God, if I can't sing, how will I worship you? How will I worship you? And these days, I don't really sing much. Well, not publicly, anyway, except with the mums and toddlers. I'm very good at miming the words. So when you look at me, you think, oh, she's singing well. No, I'm not. I'm miming the words. And added to that, I'm quite deaf now, so I've got the whole package. Can I still worship? You bet I can. You bet I can. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you find singing difficult or noise intrusive in your worship, I know it's hard, but still worship. Matt Redman wrote these words just for me, I think. No, he didn't, but I'd like to think. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. I'll bring you more than a song, 
For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I've learnt the value of worship in stillness and quiet. It's much easier to hear his still small voice as well. Back to the subject in hand. I want to address our passion for the gospel or lack of it this morning. What is mission? To share God's love? Absolutely, but it's much more than just loving others. Let's remind ourselves, and this is where it gets simple, 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 before we go any further, what we mean by the gospel. What do we mean by this good news of Jesus? Because if we're not clear about what we mean about the gospel, about the good news, we won't be able to share it with others. We just won't be able to do it. Whether you're a new believer or you've been a Christian for years, the truth never changes. And I never tire of hearing it. So let's remind ourselves what we believe. God loves us so much that he gave his only son who died for my sins, for your sins, and rose again. And he's alive today. And when we say sorry, he offers us forgiveness. And the free gift of eternal life is ours. And that's good news, yeah? That's very good news. That's the gospel. And I am not ashamed of this good news of Christ. It's the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. And that's a quote from Romans 1, 16. Mission is about communicating the gospel, the good news. Simple, isn't it? It's simple. So then why aren't I doing it? Why aren't I doing it? We just heard read in one, uh, Acts 1, verse 8, we're witnesses. Do you know what the word witnesses means? It means to have a knowledge or an experience of. Well, we've got a knowledge and an experience of the truth of the gospel. We're witnesses to what Jesus has done in our lives. Now, we can support missionary work, and I, I, it's the right and proper thing to do, and we can pray, and we should pray. But people... There's a, there's a mission field right on our very doorstep. Read it again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now for the disciples... Jerusalem was their neighbourhood. Our Jerusalem is Hampton, or wherever we live. Judea and Samaria were places a little bit further away, and perhaps our Judea and Samaria could be places where we go to work, maybe. And the ends of the earth. Well, finally, the disciples were to take the good news to the whole world. We're to share the gospel with anyone who doesn't know it. You know, God doesn't need to send anyone to speak to your friends, your family, your neighbours, your work colleagues about Jesus, because you're there. Now, I do realise that we're all different. And I find it relatively easy to, you know, to just strike up a conversation with a complete stranger, but Peter doesn't. An example, we were in Selina in Malta and we were staying in the bishop's house. Now, you might say, oh, nice, staying in the bishop's house in Malta. There hadn't been a bishop in that house for a very long time, I can tell you. And to say that it was tired was an understatement. The bishop's house was attached to the Anglican church next door and 
locals obviously thought that anybody who came out the front door was in touch with the Almighty. The bus stop was literally outside the front door. Of course, my nature is to say, oh, good morning, and time and time again, as we left the building, I'd find myself getting involved in family problems, health issues, worries of one kind or another. I'd say, I'll pray for you, and, and I meant it. One lady said to me, oh, I'm asking the Virgin Mary for her help. I said, I'll pray to the Father for you, if you like. Peter found it all just a tad too much and refused to stand next to me at the bus stop. <laughs> As I said, we're all different. But I wonder, when did you last talk about the weather? Do you know, it's amazing. I can talk about the weather, my grandchildren, my health, the cost of living, just like that. Do you know, quite simply, we have the best news in the whole world and we keep it to ourselves. Mm. Hugh Palmer, rector of All Souls Langham Place in London, said this and it's challenging, I'm warning you. The reason we do not share the gospel with people is either because deep down in our hearts we don't really believe it or we do not love people enough to tell them. That, for me, was an ouch moment. Yes, I believe it. So I, I suppose I don't love people enough. God's challenged me preparing for this to be honest about who I am. What Jesus has done for me. And, and I'm again asking him, after years of not doing it, to open doors that I might share just something of him with people that I meet. This is Matthew 9, verses 36 to 38, and it's the message. He, Jesus taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep without, with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers on your knees and pray for harvest hands. Now you might cringe at the thought of starting up a conversation about Jesus with a friend or a colleague, but you can pray. Prayer is essential. We've got to pray for our neighbours, our friends and our family because we are the workers. We are the harvest hands. We are the prayer warriors. And whilst you're at it, pray for boldness. Pray for opportunities. Pray for each other. Now you might say, well, I have very few opportunities to share my faith. You, you, you should live where I live or whatever. Do you know, we don't even have to leave the building to have opportunities to share the faith. Honestly, the other week, my granddaughter, she's 14, or our granddaughter, she was asked by her mum, would you like to be homeschooled, Esther? Because let's face it, for our teenagers, life is tough to be a Christian at school these days. She paused and then she replied, no, I wouldn't, mummy. Who would be the salt and the light in that place if I was not there. She's 14 and she gets it. Now I'm sharing this with you because here at CSK we're being trusted by God with the next generation. We've got large numbers of young people who are relying on us to disciple them, to equip them, to encourage them, to share their faith and we have a chance to be part of their mission. So, we had that notice about our youth worker. Pray earnestly, pray earnestly for our next youth leader and be prepared to help. They can't do it on their own. Another opportunity. This one, God gives us this one on a plate. No, I don't want that yet. 
On a Thursday morning, some 50 plus mums, grandparents, carers come across the threshold with all their little ones. What an opportunity to share the faith with them. The problem is, so often we have such a small team that we're too busy practically to mention Jesus. I go home, as others do, so dispirited by Thursdays like that. Just this last Thursday, a young mum, she comes up to me, she's got this gorgeous little baby um, making coffee. And I say to her, oh, what a lovely baby. And then the Holy Spirit said, more, Heather, more, more. And I'm thinking, oh, my. So I said, what a blessing from God she is. And her face lit up. And she said, she is a blessing from God, isn't she? And I thought, small step. That was a small, minute little conversation. But I know that with the Holy Spirit, that has a huge potential. Remember the gifts that we've mentioned in our talks on a Sunday morning. You know, some are teachers, some are evangelists, some are generous givers, some are encouragers, administrators. Hospitality is a gift of the Spirit. If you're uncomfortable about sharing your faith, come and help practically to free others up who are comfortable about sharing their faith. It's teamwork. It's teamwork. There are opportunities right before our very eyes. We're letting them slip away. And we should be ashamed about that. That is not good enough, CSK. Let us remind ourselves of our reading. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Can I have the next picture, please? Because it's not coming up. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father never intended us, his children, to live for him without his help. To live without the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Now, I read this, and I thought it was very helpful. Once you begin to venture into the world of missions, it's easy to get overwhelmed. It seems near impossible to change one person's heart, let alone a whole community, and it is actually impossible. The task of missions cannot be completed by good intentions, sheer effort. It requires something else, power. Yes, we must go, but not in our own strength, because God's mighty power through his Holy Spirit is going to work through us. Since I started preparing this talk, these words have just resonated in my soul. Almost daily, I was saying them as I was walking the dog. Luke 4, 18, and it's a quote from Isaiah 61. It's what Jesus is saying. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. I want to rephrase it slightly. Please forgive me, Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he has anointed us to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent us to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. Please pray that God would open doors for you to speak for him to others. Ask him how you can support areas of ministry and mission right here. Because when we play our part, the Holy Spirit 
releases such power. If you love Jesus, then the Spirit of the Lord is upon you to proclaim the good news. Amen.